Derek's musically gifted. Another savant who lives in England is Stephen Wiltshire. He can draw amazing cityscapes from memory. Among his many demonstrations of this, he's taken a helicopter ride over London and drawn the city from memory in uncanny detail afterwards. You may have read about him in Oliver Sacks's book, An Anthropologist on Mars. But these are not the only talents autistic savants possess. Patricia Howland, Professor of Clinical Child Psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College, London, studied some autistic people who had other sorts of expertise. They were generally skills related to computational ability, mathematical ability. So people who could, in an instant, multiply two numbers in their millions in their heads. Another skill that's particularly associated with autism is the ability to identify what day a particular date fell on. So if asked what day of the week was the 13th of February 1342, they'd be able to tell you that and can do that for more recent dates as well as dates in the future. And other sorts of skills were memory-related skills more generally, so remembering places, remembering routes, sometimes quite complicated routes across the country, often many years after they'd done the journey in the first place. So really, computational skills, these so-called calendrical calculators and memory skills were the main ones that we found in our group. The group Patricia Harlan studied are autistic people who've been followed since they were first diagnosed at about age seven. They're now in their 40s and 50s. The studies looked at various aspects of their development, their cognitive skills and their particular problems. Pat wanted to know how many savants there were in the group. Generally, it's been claimed that around 10% of people with autism may have special skills. But in fact, in our study, we found much higher rates. The total number of people we were looking at was almost 140. About 100 of those were males and, and the remainder females. We found that the special skills were much more common in males. So around a third of males had special skills of some sort, mainly calendrical calculating, but a much smaller smaller proportion of the females showed these special skills. So it does seem to be a faculty that's more evident in males. We also looked at what their general level of intelligence was because quite a lot of the reports on so-called savant skills have made the claim that these are skills that are found only in people with very low intellectual ability. But in fact, in our study, and I think increasingly in some other research that's been done, that doesn't seem to be the case, that in our group, everybody who showed a special skill had an IQ either in the average range or in the borderline range of a very mild intellectual disability. We didn't have anyone with severe intellectual disabilities who showed these skills. What all of Pat's subjects did share, of course, was autism. Autism is a developmental disorder that's characterised by problems in social interaction, communication, and rigid and repetitive behaviours and interests. And all of these are present from early in life, before age three. Difficulties of social interaction are absolute core to autism, so the manifestation can be very different from a child who's aloof and silent to an adult who's very interactive but in a socially inappropriate way. But all people on the autism spectrum have social problems. Francesca Happe is the Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College, London. She told me what it is about autism that can contribute to talent. I believe the starting engine for special skills in autism is the eye for detail. People with autism seem to see the world at a level of detail the rest of us don't. They pay attention to and remember details of the world that the rest of us miss. While so-called neurotypicals, those without autism, focus on the big picture... People with autism pay attention to the details, and that gives you a good start in a number of talent domains, including art, music, and calculation. That's the most important thing, then. What about other factors? I think the difficulty in reading other people's minds that's so characteristic of autism also plays in to the way that autistic talent develops. 
because people with autism aren't automatically reading other people's minds, this protects their original thought in a number of ways. Um, firstly, most people, ordinary people, wear sort of blinkers that are imposed by the peer group. As we grow up, we share other people's thoughts, we think like others, we want to think like others. People with autism don't, and so their strain of thought is genuinely more original. Secondly, the person with autism may not be using time and neural space for social skills. Most ordinary people are social savants. We remember thousands of faces and hundreds of social incidents in our lives. People with autism probably aren't using those parts of the brain for social skills. Maybe you can use them for other skills. And lastly, I believe that the difficulty in reading minds in autism may also imply in some part that there's difficulty reading one's own mind. And it's certainly the case that some types of talent benefit from being less self-aware and less self-conscious. And it may be po more possible, it may be easier for somebody with autism to go into a state of flow where they're lost in the moment of a creative or um, talent act than it is for an ordinary person who's busy reflecting on their own mental states. participant at the meeting was Temple Grandin. She's Professor of Animal Science at Colorado State University and she has autism. You may have read about her too in An Anthropologist on Mars. When she's faced with a problem she always starts with the details. I finally figured out that a lot of normal people can't think unless they make a hypothesis first. I go the other way. I, I, I like to look at a whole bunch of data and I put the pieces together sort of like forming a jigsaw puzzle. Now, I might have the puzzle two-thirds of the way together, and I can sort of figure out what the picture on the puzzles is, is going to be. Now, there's certain kinds of troubleshooting and problem-solving that I'm extremely good at. So I ask a lot of detailed questions and, and kind of um, put the little pieces together. Now, the disadvantage of my kind of thinking, it's slow. You have to, I, have a, I have to have a lot of information in my brain. And today, now that I'm 61 years old, I can troubleshoot much faster than I could when I was in college. I, I would get all these journal articles and I'd write the uh, bottom line of each journal article's research project, the findings on little slips of paper, and put hundreds of these on a bulletin board and categorize them on a bulletin board. I now have internalized that bulletin board. I've thrown that out now. I don't use that anymore. And I've gotten a lot faster at, at, at doing these, this sort of categorization. Temple Grandin's a world expert in designing plants where livestock's taken to be slaughtered. If animals are frightened or manhandled in such a plant, they'll be stressed. And apart from the animal welfare imperative, stress can damage the quality of their meat. Temple Grandin's designed a third of all the livestock handling facilities in the United States, facilities which take account of the animal's natural behaviour and enable them to be killed without stress. She says that seeing the details has been key to this expertise. Well, when I first started out working with animals, I had to figure out they're afraid of getting slaughtered. So I would go to the swift plant, watch the cattle go up the races, and then I'd go to the feedlot, watch them vaccinate them, back and forth between the two places. They behaved the same way in both places. And I found that in both places, they were afraid of things that we wouldn't be afraid of. A little chain hanging down in the chute, a coat on a fence, you know, a sparkly reflection on shiny metal a reflection on a mud puddle, seeing a person up ahead. And if you get rid of these little things they're afraid of, then they'll walk right up the chute. They're also worried about the dark. I found in many of the plants I added a light on the entrance of the race. And then the animals would just go into the race. And I'd get down the races and see what they're seeing. And when I started doing that back in the 70s, people thought I was absolutely out of my mind at doing this. You know, see what cattle are seeing? That's just absolutely stupid. But it made total sense to me. And I find it's difficult in working with a lot of the managers to get people to see the details. Um, because lots of times you have to find a whole bunch of these details. Like maybe I have to light up a light in one place because it's dark. I got another place where there's a reflection. I got a chain hanging down over here and I got a hat hung up on the fence over here. And I better find all four of those things and get rid of them. Because if I don't find all four of them, uh, the animals are going to balk and they're going to back up and they're going to refuse to walk up the race. <laughs> 